there's one thing that will end your career as a creator, it's lost footage. We're gonna make sure that never happens. So let me start taking this apart and we're running into our first problem. So at this point, I'll need to make a compromise. We're building the world's cheapest NAS or network attached storage device. In just one video, we will teach you the basics of networking, storage infrastructure, and everything in between. We'll show you how to make one, We'll show you how it works and why it just might save your creative life. So I wonder if this case was the right decision. So you've probably heard the word NAS thrown around a lot, especially if you're a creator. NAS. 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 Network attached storage. I put together a NAS. I just put an enterprise NAS in my house. I faced a massive issue storage. So I got myself one of these that became the single biggest upgrade to how I handled my entire digital existence. You can think of it as a magical solution to managing all of your files and workflow. But here's the thing, getting started with networking and storage can be a daunting task, especially if you're a creator that just wants to make art. On top of the technical complexities, these NASs are not cheap. The entry-level NAS from a brand like Synology or QNAP will cost you thousands of dollars. Our current Synology system is well over $10,000, while a fully scaled production company like Linus Media Group will have a system that's well over $100,000. And that's a lot of money. Look, we get it. In our early days as a production company, we bought this NAS and we almost went broke doing so. But it forever changed how we work as a team. As a creator, you're not focused on storing. You just want to be the best at what you do. But as you start dealing with terabytes and terabytes of footage and projects on the day-to-day -day basis, it becomes overwhelming pretty quickly. Relying on separate external drives can be risky. If one fails, you lose everything. If you're trying to find something, you're gonna to have to rummage through many different hard drives just to get to what you need. And not to mention having to hoard a bunch of them over time. If you're not thinking about a NAS now, you're going to feel it later when an external drive fails on you or you run out of storage again. So let's start with the basics. What exactly is a NAS? And you can think of it as a supercharged hard drive, but instead of plugging that hard drive directly into your computer, you connect it to the network. This means that all your files, whether they're video footage, high resolution photos, or even your massive design projects, they're all stored in one central place, accessible from any device on the network. Or while of course being reliable and secure at the same time. It also provides a platform for seamless collaboration when working with teams so that everyone is interconnected. There are two ways you can use your NAS in your workflow. The first is NAS as a backup drive. In this instance, your computer's data is backed up to the NAS, so that even if your computer crashes, you always have a copy of the data stored separately away from the physical machine. But you will still primarily access and modify the data on your computer. You will just make sure to periodically back up that data to the NAS. This approach is what we used for the first two years of running our production company. It's still a great way to ease into the NAS workflow with fewer rigid hardware requirements and thereby lower startup costs. And that's exactly what we'll focus on in this video. The second is NAS as a live drive, which is our current workflow. Now this requires dedicated hardware and advanced knowledge in networking. This process can seriously accelerate your production pipeline. All your data is stored directly on the drive and edits happen also directly on it. Think of it as centralized storage where anyone with the right permissions, of course, can access and modify data. This keeps your computer free from storing data locally. So losing a computer or even replacing one won't affect your central system or your central data. We'll explore this setup in an upcoming video. But today, we're gonna try and build the world's cheapest NAS so that you can explore the concept of networking and NAS and centralized data without making the major investment. Okay, so let's start things off by trying to find a used cheap computer that can form the shell of the NAS. Remember, NAS operating systems don't have very rigid hardware requirements. So a used pre-built machine in the likes of Dell, Lenovo, HP should be just fine, or even an older gaming PC. But now I'm just thinking, do we have any older hardware that we can use for this? Hey, so come with me real quick. I wanna show you something. Watch your head as you get in here, the roof gets real low. Now this is one of the many, many storage corners in our studio. This one specifically is where tech goes into retirement. You can actually see our original Synology up there as well. 
but that's not what I'm here for. I am looking for something specific. So within the ecosystem of NAS, you have three key elements. You have your computer, you have your network, and you have your hard drives. The components you use for each of these really depend on the case scenario. So let's look at this particular instance where a NAS is used as a backup. There are four key elements that determine how to approach it. To break it down, there is capacity, redundancy, accessibility, and to a lesser extent, speed. So let's take a look at them one by one. One. Capacity. The capacity of your NAS depends on how much data you need to store. For us, we aim for a storage capacity that covers two to three years worth of data. Beyond that, you're looking at technology advancements, which would need you to upgrade your entire system. So usually for us to make this calculation, we look at how much data we gather on a weekly or monthly basis, and then multiply that by the number of years we estimate to use the device. At this point, you'll probably need to figure out the number of drives you need and the capacity on each of those drives. And with that choice comes the decision of buying a pre-built system versus building your own. Let's look at pre-built NAS systems first. The main players in the space are Synology and QNAP, but there are also boutique players like Jellyfish and 45 Drives. The biggest advantage of pre-built systems are its dedicated software and hardware that are optimized for this use case. Since NASA's call for highly reliable systems, and if you're not used to building systems or the stakes are just too high to experiment with your data, then pre-built is the way to go. But what are the disadvantages? These companies often bucket their devices into distinct user groups, which means every device will be a compromise for your requirement. For example, the maximum number of drives you can add is fixed based on the NAS you buy. Even the expansion options, you'll eventually reach the limit of how many drives you can add, at which point you'll need to upgrade to a whole new device. And another example, and one that hits close to home, was us wanting to upgrade to a 10 gig which is a faster networking standard, but there were no plug and play upgrades for our NAS. Long story short, these systems don't grow as you grow. On the pre-built front, we initially started with a four bay Synology NAS and then moved up to an eight bay version. And when that wasn't enough, we added in a five bay expansion unit, running a total of 13 drives. These systems tend to be very stable. Our Synology has been running nearly 24-7 for over three years with minimal downtime. We also have an exact duplicate of the system in a separate location, which is a mirrored copy of all of the data. This is called an offsite backup. We clearly love pre-built systems like Synology, but as we mature as a team, we need tailor-made solutions that are built around our requirements. Now, the benefits of building your own NAS is that everything is scalable. If you want to add more drives to increase capacity, sure. You need to add more RAM to increase caching, no problem. The options are endlessly customizable. Now in this video, we are going to focus mainly on cost. And with that in mind, we have no option but to explore building one ourselves with only what is essentially needed. And with that, let me present our trusty Lenovo N800. This old faithful has been with us since the day we first started. And we somehow find new ways to keep reusing this machine. So let's look at a hypothetical calculation to determine how much data you would need. Let's assume you're a photographer that's just starting out and you write about one terabyte of data each year. Then assuming the shelf life of your NAS is about two years, you'll need two terabytes of total usable data. So technically a single two terabyte hard drive would work just fine. So I'm noticing that you can find a lot of server grade mechanical hard drives at low cost and in good condition. The recommendation is that you try and find a Seagate Ironwolf drive or a WD Red drive because they're built for this purpose. So pro tip, avoid using drives like WD Purple and Seagate Skyhawk. These are easily available on the used market because they're designed for CCTV systems, not NAS systems. And they have lower read and write speeds, which can affect your NAS's performance. But that brings us to our next factor for consideration. Redundancy. Now this is a very complicated topic, primarily revolving around RAID structures. We're going to take a rain check on this, but we will pick it up in the next video. But for now, all you need to know is that to hedge against the risk of one of your hard drives failing, 
and losing all the data, we're going to use the RAID 1 architecture, which mirrors the data across at least two drives, so that if one drive fails, your data is safe on the other. So in this case, we're going to need two 2TB two hard drives in order to meet our requirement. All right, so let me start taking this apart. You know, we've probably taken this apart at least a dozen times in its time here. It's been our main computer for a while, then it was our support computer, then it was decommissioned for a while, and now it's back. Okay, so there's two PCIe cards in here. This first one, we'll keep a secret for right now, but we'll show it to you in the next video. And this second card, well, it's a very special card. It's called a 10 gig networking card. It's going to be an important part of how this build builds out in the future. But for right now, let's just assume you don't have a 10 gig card and you're relying on the network port on the back of your motherboard. Now in this particular computer, or in the case of this particular motherboard, it's a one gig connection. So we're going to have to rely on one gig for right now. Now we're running into our first problem. This Lenovo machine only accepts a single 3.5 inch hard drive, which is kind of important for a NAS build because the more hard drives your NAS can take, the more capacity, the more redundancy, and the more speed you can build out to. A single drive just won't cut it. But we do have the option of adding multiple 2.5 inch mechanical or SSD drives. Now SSD is out of the question because they're far too expensive for this build, but we can opt for 2.5 inch mechanical drives. Now the problem with 2.5 inch mechanical drives is that they don't quite come in the speeds and capacities that the 3.5 inch versions come in. So at this point, I'll need to make a compromise. I'll need to decide what I want to do, what the capacity is, and what hard drives I can find to meet that requirement. For NAS, accessibility plays a huge role in the way it functions. This usually boils down to the type of network the NAS operates in. There are a few speeds that networking is usually classified on. The simplest form of connection between your NAS and your computer is connecting them via Ethernet cable. Now this works fine, but you would lose internet access because you sacrifice the only Ethernet port on the back of your motherboard. Now you could solve this by connecting your NAS and your computer to the ports in the back of the broadband router your ISP provides. But you will soon run out of ports and eventually you're going to have to buy a dedicated network switch. Now let's move on to speed. Now this is usually determined by the fastest speed of the slowest device on your network. Now let's assume that you have one gigabit connections on your NAS, on your switch, and your computer. That means you can transfer that data up to 120 megabytes per second. But you're writing that data to a single mechanical hard drive, which is usually limited to a writing speed of about 80 megabytes per second. That means in this scenario, the bottleneck is the hard drive. So increasing your network speed has no impact on your overall performance. And the opposite is also true. Increasing your hard drive speed beyond the one gigabit connection will not see any performance improvements, which is why increasing your speed requires advancements in all areas. Faster networks, faster hard drives, and faster computers. Let's keep in mind that most of these solutions exist on the enterprise grade. This is due to their high startup and maintenance costs. We moved up to 10 gigabit networking after using one gigabit for the longest time. It improved our workflow by leaps and bounds, but that did come at an incredible cost. More on this in the future. Now for our build today, let's focus on the one gig network, which is probably the network you're running right now. But let's double check that. On your computer, go into network adapter settings and verify your network adapter speed. If you know what motherboards in your computer, then you can also check your motherboard menu. For your NAS system, it's very similar. You want to log in to your NAS interface and find it under network speed. Now you can usually find the transfer speeds on the back of your router, but if not, you can search up the model number and find that information in the menu. A brief pause in the learning. If you haven't realized already, we are new to YouTube. Now, if you want to help us out, you can hit that subscribe button. If there's anything you want to learn across technology or photography or video, drop us a comment below and we'll get to each and every one of them. While I keep looking for drives on Facebook Marketplace, let's look at the next factor for consideration. For this build, our machine comes with 8 GB of RAM. We have two 1 terabyte, 2.5 inch hard drives, and also a USB to hold our operating system. For connectivity, we'll use Ethernet cables and the router our ISP has provided, just to keep things simple. 
I also need a monitor and some cables to hook up the system for initial setup. Now that we have everything in hand, we can go ahead with the start of the build. I'm settling on these one terabyte WD blue drives. Now I've got two of these drives and I just need to figure out how to get them mounted into the case. Just for comparison, this is what a 2.5 mechanical drive looks like next to a 3.5 mechanical drive. These drives both have the same physical connector, but the additional real estate allows it to operate a lot faster and have a lot more capacity. So I'm running into yet another problem with this Lenovo system. And I'm starting to wonder if this case was the right decision. I need this proprietary power cable in order to power two drives. I could order that cable and wait till it arrives, but in the, for the sake of time, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use one of these splitter cables and split that power distribution from a single cable to two of the drives. Now, given that 2.5 inch drives, I'm not too worried about the power distribution. Now, before we close up the case on this build, it's generally good practice to turn on your system and ensure you have a good boot up before you close things off. I right, grab those USBs, mouse and keyboard plug in, mouse in, and out keyboard in. Okay, we should be good. And power. Okay, no power, that's not a good sign. Oh, look, we haven't given it power here. Right, so let's make sure that guy's turned on as well. Please work. And power. Nice, that's a good start. Okay, we're getting the Lenovo screen and we immediately want to get into the BIOS and we do that by hitting F1. So I want to check a few things. The first thing is I want to ensure that our SATA drives are all recognized. So how am I going to do that? I'm going to go here into startup and this will vary based on your motherboard. You want to go to boot sequence and ensure that all your drives are showing up. So we've got the WD drive showing up there. We've got the second drive showing up here as well. So we should be good to go. Just on a side note, before we boot up the NAS build, we need to make sure that we prepare the operating system, which is easily done using a USB. Our choice of OS is TrueNAS, which is one of the more popular systems out there. We'd also need to connect the NAS via a web browser so we can tweak some of those settings just making sure they all work just right. To better guide you in this process, we'll leave a link to TrueNAS themselves in the description below. Okay, so we're using two USB drives, one as the boot drive, so that has the initial installation of TrueNAS, and one to hold the operating system. Now, TrueNAS does not recommend you use a USB drive to hold the operating system in the long term. But in this particular case, we're cognizant of cost. We had a USB lying around, so we're gonna use it and see if it works. As TrueNAS finishes up the install, I'm gonna close up the computer and get it prepped and ready for configuration. Now, once the OS is done installing, you can connect the device to the network using an ethernet cable. You'll be provided an IP address, which you can then use on a separate computer to log into the user interface. It is on the user interface that you'll configure things like users, groups, and pools. Now, there is extensive information on how to get this configured online. We'll provide links to each of them below. Now, the final step will be to make sure that all your devices on your network can see your new NAS. This process is called setting up SMB share. Now, there's a really great video on this by SpaceRex here on YouTube. We'll link him below. Let's now check how fast the NAS actually is at copying files across the network into the new system. So once SMB share is set up, the drive should show up here in your network locations. We go in there and there are no files, but that's expected. Now I've got a couple of files here. Now what's this? A couple of gigs of video files. I'm gonna drag that from my desktop into the NAS and see how fast it goes. So 113, 111, 112 megabytes per second. Now that is pretty good because that is very close to the theoretical limit of one gig per second, which is the network speed we're rated for. So we've completely saturated the network. The only other question then is, if we increased our network performance, would we actually get faster transfer speed? 
but maybe that's a story for another day. While there's plenty of information available, we still haven't seen most of the creative community fully embrace solutions like this. We've personally experienced how much of an impact this has made to our overall workflow in our production pipeline. With limitations where cost and resources are concerned, we think it's important to look at the viable alternatives in order to help solutions reach the hands of many. By building the world's cheapest NAS, we hope that you too would be inspired to make one.